Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Caleb Sion. Um, Caleb is the founder of Textile Hive, a Portland-based archive that houses the Andrea Arno Textile Design Collection. This incredible collection includes over 40,000 samples that span 50 countries. Today, we're going to get a tour of the archive and take an in-depth look at some of the Batik and Shibori highlights from this archive. Uh, facilitating today's lecture is internationally recognized textile designer Trish Langman, who we're very fortunate to have teaching with us this term. I'll be behind the scenes um, to assist the audience and panelists as needed um, and join you during the question and answer form at the end. Uh, but in the meanwhile, please feel free to type any questions or comments that you have in the chat as they arise and we will do our best to, to address them as we go. Um, thank you again for being with us today um, and Caleb and Trish, I'm going to turn it over to you. So hi, um, I'm so happy to be here today and to be talking to um, Caleb uh, with his amazing collection. Um, I see that um, I have my students here and some other people here today. Uh, this is going to be a treat. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Shibori is and you don't know what Batik is, I'm just going to give you a quick run through of that so that you can see it in the con look at the collection in that context. So, uh, so Shibori is a kind of ancient Japanese technique. Um, it looks similar to tie-dye, but uh, there is a slight difference uh, with shibori. It's more about folding. Uh, they often used wood blocks and all sorts of um, natural objects to get uh, to create pattern. Uh, with normal tie-dye, it's more, more twisting and you know pinching uh, fabric and then dyeing the fabric. Uh, and you often see the uh, shibori fabrics in indigo dyes in blue. I'm sure you've all seen this, but. Uh, Caleb has some really beautiful pieces that he's going to be treating us to today. Uh, Batik um, is um, an Indonesian based um, textile technique. Um, you see it all over the world. Uh, it's originated in Java in, uh, in, in the small villages. Um, it's basically another way to kind of screen out um, screen out sort of dye. So like a stenciling technique, but you're using the batik as your stencil. Uh, and so, you know, they paint on the wax and then afterwards, you know, you dye the fabric. And again, um, Caleb has some wonderful things that he's gonna share with us today. So well, without further ado, I'm gonna let Caleb take it away and show us his collection. Thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Trish and Allison. Um, let me start by sharing my screen. for bearing with me as pull up my notes. Uh, so I'm excited to look at some textiles together uh, with you all today, as well as tell the story behind our collection. Uh, Textile Hive is based here in downtown Portland, and this is the view from the entrance of our studio, just to give you uh, a little context. At the heart of our collection is my mother, Andrea Arena, who you see pictured here. Uh, she's had a lifetime love affair with textiles that started when she used to pick out fabrics with her mother growing up in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, my mom had, has had three distinct phases of her career. Her first began in 1969 uh, on the Lower East Side of New York City uh, when she opened up her custom leather and snakeskin boutique called Dakota Transit. Uh, the styles of her clothes connected with the mood and energy of the time. And between 1969 and 1973, Dakota Transit achieved success being featured in Vogue having a runway show and attracting a wealthy clientele of socialites and popular musicians like Miles Davis and Jimi Hendrix. By 1973, however, after becoming a mother and increasing drug use and crime became more prevalent in New York City, she was ready for a change and a trip to Peru would send her on a new path. On her visit to Peru, she fell in love with the weavings of the indigenous people in the Sierra Central. After she returned home, she was determined to visit again and was able to convince the Peruvian government to hire her to document the weavings being produced. 
When that research ended, she began to independently document and assemble and create collections of handmade Peruvian textiles, clothing, and costumes to sell to museums. In addition to Peru, she spent time documenting and putting together several other major collections in China in 1983. And finally, uh, she spent three years living and researching and collecting in Japan between 1984 and 1987. About half of her collections were acquired by major museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the British Museum, and the Royal Scottish Museum, among others. While in Japan, in addition to collecting kimonos, she also started to collect kimono fabric swatches to document how patterns evolved over the decades. And on a visit to New York, a friend suggested that the Japanese swatches she was collecting could be a source of inspiration to fashion and surface designers. In 1987, she moved back to New York City and opened up Andrea Arenau Textile Documents in Union Square. Her business provided inspiration to home furnishing and fashion companies. The basis of her business started with all Japanese textiles, but soon expanded to include swatches from many other countries. Over the years, the collection served hundreds of companies that included Ralph Lauren, Pendleton, Adidas, The Gap, Marnie, and Alexander McQueen, among others. In 2003, I joined her company and helped expand the business until 2008 when I decided I was ready for a change and moved to the Pacific Northwest. In 2009, after 20 years of business, my mom decided to close the studio and subsequently I proposed the idea of digitizing the collection to see if it could be more widely utilized with the ultimate goal of finding the collection a new home. In the spring of 2009, the collection arrived bundled up, like you see in this photo, and uh, my digitization project lasted roughly until 2012. The project had several components and stages that you can see represented on this slide and graphic. Uh, it involved about a team of 15 people. Uh, the first stage was to digitize each odd object at max, maximum resolution and color fidelity. The second stage involves developing a hierarchical taxonomy to describe both the visual attributes such as pattern, layout, and style, as well as objective attributes such as material, technique, country of origin, and object type. In total, the taxonomy we created included 18 high-level categories and over 2,300 terms. Once the taxonomy was cr created, each piece was cataloged. Developing the taxonomy and keeping the cataloging consistent was one of the most challenging aspects of the project. As part of the project, we recorded several interviews with my mother to try and capture her unique curiosity and way of seeing and looking at textiles. The final stage of the project was to develop a visual database to allow people to search and filter through the collection. And the database was designed to be integrated with the physical collection. So you could start with a textile and scan its barcode and then find out more information about it or start digitally and find textiles to examine, examine and handle more closely. Looks like my slide is stuck. Uh, anyhow, uh, I think we're going to move uh, this over to looking at textiles now. Um, just to give a little bit of a background, uh, Textile Hive launched in 2014 as a plan B when we were unable to find a new home for the collection. And now I'm excited to start showing you some textiles with Trish. There's the last slide. All right, so now we're looking at textile and can you all see my screen? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. 
All right, sorry right. about that. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Trish. Yeah, so um, I mean, these look um, fantastic. And uh, for those of you who aren't in my class, uh, you know, um, Shibori um, is um, like it's an art, it's an art, basically, you know, being able to sort of place objects and find out where they where they go. And you can kind of have a if you have a look at what's going on here in these in these textiles, you can kind of um, you can kind of see how they've um, you know placed objects and uh, uh, twisted them and uh, you know put them into the dies uh, with very careful um, you know very careful with the way that they look at composition. So if you look at the striping one that comes down below, they're kind of using um, just a basic um, um, sort of uh, objects around that they've used to kind of um, tie up and then create that kind of round circular part of the textiles. And you can kind of see that they've created a stripe uh, and that can be done by using an object uh, and then wrapping the, you know, and then wrapping the textile. Um, and then you can kind of see this, um, lots of these are, are, are kind of regional. So if you look around, if you looked up sort of Japanese textiles, um, different regions have different types of textiles that they like to that they like to use. Um, if you look on the side over there, you can kind of see some of them that have kind of like what looks like a chain stitch, uh, and you would be correct in um, looking at, at saying that. So if you look at the stripe um, number seven that's over there, if you could just pick that out <laughs> over there, uh, you can kind of see that um, they they've had like little dots. Uh, this is often achieved by uh, using um, stitching. Um, so, you know, you can cross stitch, you can chain stitch, you can um, basically do a, a basic running stitch. And uh, if you pull the fabric and tighten it by gathering and then dip it into dye, you get these kind of really wonderful kind of textures that you can create. So if you kind of look at um, like number seven, you can sort of see that they've done some stitching. And again, it gives you an element of control. Uh, for those of you who've ever done tie dye, you'll realize that the, you know, there's element of no control because the dye sort of goes where it is. When you begin to sort of work with stitching, you begin to get that element of control where you can actually create pattern, you can create stripes. Um, and you know, in my class, this is what we've been learning, how to control the dye, how to control the sort of patterning that you want. Um, and you can kind of see, if you look at uh, number eight, if we could just pull that up, that textile over there, which I think is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, over here, you can kind of see this, the patches of white. So that's where the, um, the dye hasn't actually uh, interacted with the fabric. And so, you know, you can sort of hide the dye, basically, <laughs> hide, the, hide the fabric from the dye by wrapping or putting an object there and then wrapping it and then you know, carefully um, immersing it where you need it to be. Um, if you look at uh, number 10, this is kind of, um, let's see, look at the textile number 10 over there. This is what you kind of see traditionally in, um, in Shibori. You see a lot of this kind of tied uh, patterning. Um, and again, like I said, it, it's, it's regional. If you look at some of the old kimonos that, uh, that, you, uh, that are around, um, Go around and say like the Edo period um, in Japan, you kind of see that they they have more kind of delicate um, kind of textile sort of shapes. Um, and if you go sort of um, as you see, if you get sort of to more modern times in Japan, you'll kind of see people kind of interacting tie dye with many different things, and so you'll see sort of things that are sort of bigger, bolder, uh, that look more like this. Um, and so this is just the basic, you know, tying technique but using stones to get the smaller, um, you know, to get the smaller parts. And then you can see the, um, the bigger parts uh, done with, you know, bigger pieces of uh, bigger objects uh, and then folding just to get that kind of line, uh, that beautiful line in there. Uh, one of the things that you can do with uh, what I love about um, uh, Shibore is that, you know, it's, um, not only is it the element of control, but also the way you can sort of play with composition. Um, so if you look at number 11 over there, uh, it doesn't always have to be blue. It can, you can actually um, play around with uh, mixing, uh, stitching and mixing the different techniques to create kind of more of an asymmetry in there. 
um, which I think is kind of unusual. And I really love this sample for that. Uh, the way that sort of the color is sort of like not the traditional colors that you see sort of group on brights. Uh, Shibori works really not well on delicate, with delicate kind of colorings as well. And also with, um, if you're using, um, you know, if you're using objects that uh, and you want to get kind of a more delicate feel to, to what you're doing. So, you know, I love this uh, sample because of that. It's like not, you know, the traditional kind of brights or heavy color that you get. Uh, if you look at um, sample 12 over there, this is a, a great mix, um, uh, again, uh, of, um, you know, using uh, the tie technique in the middle and then, um, you know, either using an object to kind of get that kind of um, tying or folding the actual circle, um, just folding until you get sort of, sort of little circles. Uh, to create this pattern. I think what is really nice about this again is the composition uh, and you'll often see this circular pattern on, uh, on um, used in traditional um, kimonos uh, and, you know, and accessories uh, for uh, Japanese um, you know, clothing. So you'll see that you know the circular pattern, you'll see the striping pattern that they that turns up. Um, but all this kind of um, sort of relates to the way the Japanese love um, the idea of things being in the imperfection of things. Uh, so if you think about Japanese wabu sabi, um, this is a whole idea that, you know, things are not necessarily perfect. There's sort of beauty in the imperfection. And I think, you know, shibori kind of fits that aesthetic perfectly. Um, you know, um, it's definitely something to sort of further research. Uh, for those of you in my class, uh, you know, we've experimented with many of these techniques in here, stitching, folding, um, and it's just good for you to see the different ways you can do it. Uh, you can play around with it. Um, like number two and number four, again, uh, if we take a look at those, uh, you can kind of see how they've sort of um, taken it to a different level. This has kind of even a three-dimensional kind of look. Uh, we, you know, anyone who's sort of done tie-dye where you've tied up a lot of stuff, you kind of get that, uh, you can get that kind of feeling from the fabric, almost sculpts itself as well from what you're doing. Uh, and if you look at number four over there, um, again, it's a, a, it gives you that, um, yeah, thank you, yeah. If you look at number four over there, um, I love the way that they've got the uh, symmetry, but they've been able to look, oops, there we go. <laughs> number four, yeah, if you, uh, I love the symmetry, uh, the symmetry they've, they've managed to do and get the sort of sense of control, but also inside, you know, you can start, kind of see there's still those tie-dye bits that, that are going, with sort of the delicacy of this, um, you know, really really works as a composition so you know i feel like if you're if you're looking for um looking at shibori uh, take a look at what happens regionally take a look at what happens historically um all the different te tying techniques and the techniques that, that are used are, um, are as you can see uh really can give you sort of different textures uh depending on what kind of objects you're using what kind of techniques you're using Um, let me have a look down at number six quickly, which is one of my favorites. Uh, so this is, um, you can see this text which I really like for like the subtlety that's going round in the circles as well. Um, and again, um, when you're looking at um, textiles, you don't often see um, textiles in, in, um, in a black, with a black dye. Uh, that's because it's really hard to get a true black. Um, so what you'll often see is like dark deeper blues in uh, traditional shibori techniques, um, but you won't often see black. So in this, this to me, like, you know, suggests this is much more, a little bit more modern uh, because you've been able to get that, um, you know, that pure black in there, uh, which is really difficult to do. They've done it with stitching going around the outside again, and then inside uh, again, just using small objects to kind of get the circles in there and then small stitching. Uh, and so you can build up texture really easily uh, and again, get that element of control in your design as well. Uh, so Caleb, you know, I know, um, do, you, do you have any idea of where your mum got these, uh, you know, regionally where she got, where she managed to? So my mom, uh, she traveled around. Um, uh, when we lived in Japan, it was 
uh, the mid 1980s when Japan was at its economic might. Um, and uh, she was really interested in um, collecting modern 20th century kimonos. Um, and, you know, at the time, people really urged her to uh, uh, pick a subject that was older because that was more, people felt like, uh, uh, especially people at museums felt like um, things that were at least uh, two or 300 years old would, would be a better uh, subject. But um, she just, you know, acquired a lot of these at flea markets. Um, she, um, she visited um, many different regions, but in the 1980s, people were, there was kind of like a nouveau riche uh, mood going on. So people really weren't interested in old things and there were recycling centers throughout uh, Japan set up. And so she was able to acquire a lot of these that pretty much been uh, just thrown out or people weren't interested or by visiting um, flea markets um, throughout uh, Japan. Um, but she always tried to, um, she was really interested and she started collecting the actual swatches um, to kind of document how the designs uh, evolved over time and regionally how um, different um, uh, regions had different uh, styles and techniques. And so when she saw something she hadn't seen before, she was really interested and then she'd start to collect. So she was trying to really um, um, teach herself um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, ended up acquiring uh, a vast amount of, of swatches, um, which then became the basis of this collection at Textile Hive. And so we have over 40,000 textiles here at Textile Hive from 50 countries, um, but about a fifth of the collection uh, or over 8,000 pieces are from Japan. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, um, I mean, she must have done so much traveling to get such a huge collection uh, of stuff. Um, I feel like, um, you know, she's got, uh, you know, I, the fact that she went off and people weren't, you know, interested in textiles and she collected all of that and then made it, in, you know, made that available to the world is so amazing. Um, I would love to talk to her at some point and just <laughs> pick her brains she's on. Really a, yeah, yeah, she's all really the a, regions that she's traveled to and, you know, uh, where, where everything came from exactly. Yeah, um, she's really an amazing person. She, I was hoping she was going to be able to, to join us this morning, but she wasn't feeling up to it. Um, but um, uh, uh, we recorded a lot of interviews with her. Last year, she gave a talk as part of Portland Textile Month in, um, uh, through PSU. Um, so really, to understand uh, and appreciate the collection, you really, uh, yeah, you do have to... Um, uh, talk to my mom. She's really the soul of the collection. And, um, you know, you can imagine the type of person that would collect, you know, and this isn't yeah. even all her textiles. Um, she, yeah, wow. she has, she has a, a lot um, from her museum collecting days, um, but she really did combine her passion for travel, uh, textiles, and just like an insatiable curiosity to learn more about them. Yeah. And just the places. Yeah. Just the story behind everything, you know, every textile will be interesting, where she got it and how she acquired them, uh, you know, because I always yeah. love the history of a fabric and where it's been all those years. And <laughs> it's, yeah, they're a little bit anonymous. I think that's the one thing in our cataloging. We tried to capture what the object was, where it was from. Um, but the one part we really are missing is, you know, the story of the maker and the person behind them. Um, we have a textile hive, we have things that were handmade, uh, as well as things that were commercially reproduced or commercially produced. And so um, I think it's really kind of important. Um, and uh, when my mom was doing the museum collecting, she was doing a lot more documentation um, in that regard. So she took, she took um, field slides and, um, and so we have a lot more records for those uh, collections that were put together for museums. Um, but for this collection, it really, it started, you know, with all Japanese textiles and then um, uh, expanded um, further. And she was trying to work with designers and um, both surface uh, and textile and home furnishing designers and helping them find inspiration or things um, 
that would inspire them um, to create uh, new new products from 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 textiles and artwork that have been produced in the past. Yeah. I mean, so it's just so amazing. I've got her stories, you know, <laughs> her stories are amazing. Um, so yeah, we're going to take a look at some of the uh, boutiques uh, in the collection. Um, and, and these are from all over. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we did a, a search, uh, Trish, Allison, and I, um, I can kind of show you how, how the search works a little bit, but, um, I think we, we started with just doing uh, a search like this. And so this pulled up all the uh, boutiques in the collection. We have over 213. And then um, you can see that we have boutiques from uh, Japan and Indonesia. And I know we also have uh, uh, some boutiques from, from Africa. And so that's how we um, kind of sorted. Um, and uh, I think we did one search where we we compared um, boutiques from Japan. Um, and I'll just do it now. To boutiques from uh, Indonesia. And so it's just a real time thing. So on the left hand side, now we're looking at uh, Indonesian boutiques. Um, and on the right hand side, um, we have Japanese. Textile. Oh, fantastic. So you're able to compare. This is just such a great resource for designers, artists, and just to be able to compare. And um, something else we do within the, the database um, is um, uh, we pull colors from each piece. Um, and you can also search by colors. Um, and so uh, it may not be the actual pattern or textile or technique that inspires you, but you may be interested in um, colors or you may not even be a textile designer, but I think there are a lot of um, that's kind of interesting. So the palette is being pulled. Uh, that's great. There. Uh, all right, sorry to, <laughs> to go into a little database demonstration. No, no, I'll it's go back it's to fantastic to, you know, what a great resource for research. Like for putting together something, yeah, I'm sure companies from all over the world use would, you know, be using that because uh, you often need a color palette to kind of, you know, go with the designs that you're doing. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, the, some of the boutique that we actually. Uh, um, so this is uh, some of the boutique that we actually looked, we sort of pulled. Um, I tried to get a sort of range, and as I said, that boutique, you know, it sort of originated in. Um, Indonesia, but you know the Dutch uh, India company, you know, uh, who kind of you know colonized that area of the world, uh, took it over to Africa, where it's become you know uh, something you know ingrained into the uh, um, into West African life basically, uh, with boutiques and then spreading to the rest of the continent. Um, so these are some really um, just wanted to show you some of the different techniques that are. Here, I know you don't have the stories behind all of them, but uh, they are sort of a really nice range. And so the one on the left we have here, which is, you know, um, you know, playing around. There's a lot in Africa, uh, they have a lot of figurative work that they do. Um, a lot of the uh, boutiques, again, have socio-political um, messages, especially the modern day boutiques. Uh, and they're often depicting life in the village or life um, as it is. Uh, you know, with modern day boutiques, you'll often find that boutique in Africa is um, something done by women, uh, which is kind of the opposite to Indonesia. You'll see quite a lot of men doing the boutique as well uh, and trained from generations. So it's like a multi-generational thing that you'll see men uh, doing boutique while in, you know, Africa, uh, you tend to, it tends to be females, uh, a female collective. But over here, you can see the tie dye in the background and then them just uh, using uh, the boutique as a, as a outlining as well. Um, do you know anything about this, um, this piece, um, Caleb? I don't, um, I love it. It, where you're it seems like it's a, it's a, it's a wrap uh, skirt. Um, let's look at the metadata yeah. we have. Um, so it's from Kenya. Yeah. Um, 
and yeah, I don't think. Yeah, um, it says that we. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Taking a look. Yeah. Here. yeah. It says conversational. Gonna... Yeah, which is for those those of you who don't know what conversational means. That means um, like in pattern, print and pattern. If you see something that depicts kind of um, objects and things as opposed to a regular pattern, it's called a conversational. So <laughs> just that little it, piece. Sorry, it's interesting to carry too. on. <laughs> It, it's interesting too, Trish, right? It it was probably the it was resisted first, right, and then printed on. It looks like I'm trying to yes, to yeah, see. yeah, yeah. So they've they've merged techniques, and so you know they've got screen print, they've got um, a little bit of batik, a little bit of um, um, dye at the background. Um, so there's like many different things going on in there. But um, I love the, the I love the mixed media. I think that that's something that's uh, Quite unique, actually, because usually when I I look at uh, textiles, you do see sort of the uh, people, but um, don't often see that that sort of the colorway as well that they've got going over there um, um, is quite unusual as well, which I like because I usually see the same sort of colors and same sort of type of region uh, in Africa. But uh, um, I really love that um, the fact that it's got sort of figures as well in there. And again, that's that element of control you can get with batik because you're drawing. Uh, with it so you know the skill set it's, uh, it's not just being a diet it's like you get you're a real artist you know who work work with um you know with the fabric um and so here you can kind of see it's like more abstract it's more of an abstract com conversational and you can see they've been drawing with something called um so with batik in uh, indonesia you uh you can do two things you can paint on the wax or you can use something called janting pen, which is spelt T-J-A-N-T-I-N-G, janting. Um, um, so basically that pen allows you to um, sort of draw and get a sort of particular type of line work that you get with the wax. Uh, and so you'll see them immerse, you know, draw their drawing and then, you know, painting um, aspects of it, fix it, and then, um, use the background so you see those crinkly bits that you see in the background that's basically cracked wax <laughs> um so you know you can see sort of that background color in there which is dark um that would be the sort of ground color that you had basically uh um and then you can sort of uh wax out or you know wax out what you what you need and what you don't want to show um dip it in uh in that color and then you would have uh, that sort of ground color in there, um, or that could be just the base fabric that you have. Um, so basically, the the, wax, the crinkling of the wax is basically just by getting, gathering up the material, the fabric together once it's waxed, and it gives this kind of effect, uh, which is you sort of see in most of the uh, boutiques that are out there. Um, so let's have a look at some things that have different textures. Um, so number three up there, Caleb. So that looks like your, yeah, the fact that you've got a sort of birds in there. I think that looks like it comes from Asia. Um, I don't know if you've got metadata to kind of <laughs> prove me wrong. <laughs> I am not sure. <laughs> um, so in, this, in yeah. this one, yeah, we don't have it. We can't confirm, but we think it's yeah. from Indonesia. So we have the visual characteristics. So sometimes you'll have, and especially this is true in Japanese textiles, um, where they're taking inspiration from different cultures. Um, so you'll have things mimicking a style. Um, so it was produced in Japan, but obviously you can you can tell it was inspired. Um, yeah. And so uh, unless we're 100% certain, we won't put the country down on the objective information, okay. but we can comment on um, the style. Um, okay, that's great. Yeah, I know you tend to see birds and cranes and things like that in Japanese, you know, ish. Um, and uh, in Indonesia, it's kind of, so that, that kind of sort of gives you the way through and also the fact that it's in blue, uh, indigo-ish, uh, again, uh, sort of suggests that as well to me. Um, so you can kind of look up, um, they have like, you can see sort of the line that they have over there as well. Um, you know, they've uh, used janting pen, they've painted it as well. Uh, and then you've got that real element of control and, you know, they've not crinkled up the wax. So there's kind of um, 
a thought, you know, there's a kind of loose kind of beauty to the to the line, but then you know they've sort of kept it kind of clean, cleaner, as opposed to you know cracking up the wax where you have all the sort of um, you know kind of lines that go through it showing the wax. So over here you can kind of see if you go up close, uh, you get sort of a, a feeling of wax, but it's um, it's quite controlled uh, the line work that they've got there. So with paintbrush and with junting pen as well. Um, so if we have a look at number four, because that's kind of interesting, because I think this is on velvet, that's <laughs> why I picked, picked it up. Um, so I worked on a project with Pendleton where we, we were on, we were on, on uh, working on wool, which was a really, really hard. Uh, velvet, again, you know, you have to be able to pull out the wax afterwards. So in Indonesia, the traditional method in India is to boil the, boil the wax off, uh, which you can boil and then you boil it again. And it's a really long process. You scoop the wax off that comes to the top. You boil it again. Uh, um, you can get it off with an iron as well. Uh, this to me looks like it's a more modern piece. So I suspect that they've actually taken the wax off using um, uh, something like dry cleaning because, uh, you know, um, so let's see where this came from. I don't know if we can get any metadata. Uh, it's just a text. So this, this is from a series um, of Japanese textiles. And so it's um, cut velvet, um, but yeah, um, yeah, they're really amazing. If you look on, if you look on the backside, they look like paintings almost, abstract paintings. Oh, wow, um, I'd love, yeah. So the, the tactileness of textiles, yeah, I would love to see that. Yeah, I've not seen a boutique on, on velvet. And, you know, when I was doing my, my project, you know, is bad enough on wool, but you know, all those, you know, you know, uh, but wax is sort of bonds to the fabric. And so the more dense your fabric, you know, the harder it is to get out. Um, um, and so, you know, today people have been using things like soy wax, uh, uh, but traditionally people would use uh, beeswax or a mix of beeswax and paraffin. Uh, so I'm suspecting that, you know, if you use that combination of beeswax and paraffin, it's kind of easy to slightly get, up, get it off. Uh, over here, I love that kind of texture that's come over here. Um, that brown one that we have. Sorry, I'm going to try and see if I can find find them so I can hold them because yeah. Oh right, yes. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carry but, on. Yeah, I bet this looks really great in in person um, because it's got um, you know uh, so much richness in the color. Um, is this on velvet as well? I wondered. Yeah, it's part of this series. So I found them now. Um, I think this is the back, um, as I was describing before. So this is what it looks like from the back. Oh, wow. Uh, this actually might be a different one. Um, uh, but and then this is from the front. Um, Um, I don't know how close I can get, but it just okay. feels like amazing. Yeah, I'm um, sure it does. Yeah, and I was wondering about the the extraction of the wax. You know, when you actually feel it. You know, you know, because you know, when when you go to Africa, because that's my heritage. Um, my mom used to bring me back loads of batiks, but there was kind of a stiffness to it. And so, yeah. you know, um, I wondered, you know, are they able to, uh, you know, retain the integrity of the fabric when you kind of? So I think, yeah, it feels really nice. It's made out of silk. Um, and so the cut velvet um, has a pattern, their little leaf pattern here. And then, the, and then, you know, there's the larger leaves and the batiks. Um, but um, yeah, I think this is really great because as big of a digital proponent as I am, you know, and obviously the database is, you know, how we're able to look at things. Their experience of handling and looking at it is just fundamentally different. And so, Textile hive was never intended to be a replacement for the physical textile. It's supposed to, it was created to be a kind of an index or like a, a way where you could dive into the collection. And obviously in this time when we're not able to have people in the space, it's much better than not being able, you know, to see the collection, but um, there's, uh, yeah, this group, they're probably about eight, textiles that are part of this group. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to, yeah, just have a feel of the fabric because, you know, uh, that is one of, that, that is kind of one of the problems of batik. It's just like getting the wax out and keeping the integrity of the fabric so that you get that. There's still, you know, it's still beautiful to feel as well as to look at, you know. 
Um, yeah, because these aren't stiff. They're really, yeah. uh, the drape is like really amazing. And yes, you, you can surely visit Trisha anytime you want. And um, hopefully <laughs> um, in, the, in, the, in the future, we'll open up tours for, for everyone as well. So um, yeah, that will be amazing. Yep. The back of this is one of my favorites. Um, so yeah, so let's have a look at number seven. That's uh, I kind of like to take a look over here. And so over here, you can kind of see a mixture of uh, brush stroking uh, and also uh, the cracking of the wax. Uh, so basically, you know, I can kind of see that they've just used brush strokes to kind of, you know, create this kind of abstract. And then, you know, um, literally put a lot of wax on there uh, and then dip dyed it, you know, put it in the dye uh, and then just let it take whatever they, you know, take to places and you can kind of see over there, you can sort of see the brush strokes in there. Uh, I really love that combination. Uh, it's, uh, it's like really beautiful and also the colors really beautiful as well. Um, is this more of, more of a modern piece you would say? Um, Yeah, and I think yeah. it's, a, it's a scarf. Um, yeah, uh, we don't have a date on that one. But um, yeah, I think um, to get back to our earlier point you're making about like conversational. So my mom definitely has a sense of humor. And so this collection has, shares her personality. Um, <laughs> and so uh, it's something that, that she collected a lot of. And um, even though we are a historic archive and most of our you know, objects are, you know, anywhere from 50 to 100 years old, I'd say, is the, the, the core um, uh, demographic or age of the pieces in our collection. Uh, some look uh, particularly modern and abstract, and I think that was just my mom's um, design sensibility. And, um, and it's true with a lot of the Japanese textiles as well. Um, some yeah. of them may be over 100 years old, but... Um, you know, the, the proportion, the scale, yeah. um, the colors um, make them look very modern. Yeah, I like number eight as well. That's sort of doing sort of a similar thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, you know, just like that. That's you can see like the more white you see, the more wax coverage there is basically. But they've managed to get kind of an abstract in there as well, <laughs> which I kind of like. Almost looks like a monoprint on top that they've done, but they've used uh, the wax. To get delicate line is just really, 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 really hard with wax. You really need to have uh, good uh, fabric and, um, uh, and wax kind of uh, bond so that you can get exactly what you want. Um, you know, I would even say, you know, they may have put that on top afterwards. I'm just trying to see if I can get closer. You need to see it in the fabric, but you know, it could be, it could have been done by hand. Uh, just to get that kind of delicate line is really, really difficult. Um, but you know, uh, you can over dye, over dye and then sort of put your, you know, uh, start off with a sort of a, um, a base color and then you know, over dye on that. And then, you know, put another color on and over dye on that. Um, this looks like to me just two colors. So that's why I was thinking that either they put, put something on top or it was, you know, done with a really, really thin uh, jumping pen uh, as well, which it has that kind of quality to it, but it's really beautiful. I love that. Um, I could, you know, I would say that I'm just want to have a kind of look further down if we can see number like number ten and twelve. Uh, so these are kind of more traditional um, uh, boutiques that you you can often see. Um, and again, you know, look at the the quality of line. So you can see that's done with a pen uh, again, and then just filled in. Um, and it looks like, you know, again, they've got played around with some uh, technique sort of at the, you know, on the border as well. Um, but that, yeah. And that to me, again, the colouring suggesting um, uh, Asia rather than Africa. Um, I kind of like the simplicity of, uh, of some of them. I love like number 12, if you look at that, just, just basic patterning. Uh, and again, that kind of... Um, you're, you're in control, but there's the element of looseness that Batik gives you that makes you, uh, that makes it um, re really beautiful. So like you get a really good quality of line. And these take a really long time to paint. It's quite time consuming. <laughs> uh, it used to take me two days to do one of my big throws that I do. Uh, but you know, with these guys, they're, they're pretty fast and it's still time consuming 
just the whole process from start to finish from waxing to uh, you know drawing out the design waxing it and then dipping it in dye okay um, so I want to make sure that we have some time to get some questions in from, from everybody so we'll just have a quick look yeah if you can sort of see the collection over there so I just want to open it up to some of um, some of my students. I know that some of them might want to um, have some some questions. Um, can you? Um, okay. So anybody who'd like to um, have a question, you can just uh, you can type in the type in the chat, and then we can. Uh, <laughs> I'll call on you. It's like the easiest to do easiest easiest way to do it. Uh, all right, Whitney. Do would you like to chat? You can say it out loud. <laughs> yeah, I was noticing some of the smaller dots, especially on the first ones you were showing us. It almost looked like the mark from a French knot, but the French knots probably don't gather the fabric enough. So I was wondering if you've ever tried that or if, like what that would end up looking like. Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. It could be, it looks like it came from a French, uh, French knot, but I think it's just, uh, um literally a stitch that they've pulled um to get that you know uh and to get a bigger circle you i guess you would just do a running stitch and pull it really tight you know uh to get those kind of circular kind of feelings to your uh in there but you could try it there's nothing to try to stop it it's just that you just have to as we said pull pull it tight uh to get those kind of um uh shibori dots in there yeah. uh, trish i just pulled out this one piece of shibori that was yeah. never finished it's kind of like a textile fossil oh really um, and you can kind of see the knots um yeah. it's for a, a, a kimono collar um and uh i'm trying to see i think it would be most similar to this where um the stitching is done diagonally um but they were never undone and so you can see they're just like thousands of individual knots um, <laughs> my goodness <laughs> yeah um yeah it can it can get really laborious i mean just if you're just you know tying and tying and tying and you can sort of see those great big balls of it uh, and then you hope that the, <laughs> the textile comes out <laughs> once you've done it <laughs> yeah uh, sometimes when you see that the, yeah the final piece it's hard to imagine you know yeah. kind of like how much how much work went into it yeah i mean it's uh, like i always say to my students like, there's a lot of prep work and then you know the actual dying takes like a few seconds you know to, <laughs> to take a few seconds but it's like you know it doesn't take that long um but all the prep that you do all the drawing and then all the tying and everything uh and then you have to hope that it, you know in those few seconds that you've got it right you know <laughs> once you plunge it into the water <laughs> into the dye um jessica did you have something i I wasn't sure if you were, had a question. I did have a question. What type of um, fabric is was is was all the the dots and stuff? Was that silk or satin? Because you said that a certain type of fabric was easier to uh, be more uh, delicate, make delicate uh, designs with. Can you? Yeah, um, I think you were talking about the shibores, um, um, Caleb. You know, the some of those dots, I think they were silk. I think that the database might probably say. How do you then not snag the fabric if it's silk and you're like doing you to... all that and not have <laughs> Extra <experience>? careful, <laughs> extra careful with it. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not easy, um, but it's trial and error. And then you sort of get, you know, you'll use the right kind of threads and, you know, you really do have to sort of um, find your technique, find your fabric that matches the, the thread uh, with it. Um, but I feel a lot of these, like, you know, it does, it does work on silk. It's just like, you know, um, um, you've just got to kind of change these people are kind of masters of it. Uh, like I said, it's like they've been training since they were really young to do this, but um, certainly some of these uh, over here, Caleb, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're on a mix of cotton and silk natural fabrics, I would imagine. I would say, yeah, most of them, yeah, I would say uh, silk or most of them, uh, and then cotton. Um, this one's interesting. It's kind of on a, a fabric that 
that's woven. So you'll see oftentimes multiple, either different types of shibori with clamping, stitching, or resisting, or sometimes they'll, they'll put on a, um, a, a different sort of fabric. But I would say most of what we have are silk. These I know are like cotton, cotton. Um, so I think, um, yeah, you, you'd know better than I, Trish, about yeah. the like the. Well, I was going to say uh, the fold. If, if you if you're using folding tape at fifty one and fifty two, it would work better on um, a cotton, just because it's not going to, um, you know, you've got more control, and you know, silk is super absorbent, so you would be better off stitching or doing, you know, knotting or you know something where you have some more control of uh, of it because it's super absorbent. Um, folding, I love that. That's so cool. Mm. <laughs> Uh, like that whole idea of just working on top of another fabric. Um, it's great. Uh, yeah, and so that you using the fabric to sort of be your texture as well. Um, that was, a, yeah, if you look at 71 with all of that that's going on in there, <laughs> that's quite a lot um, uh, to deal with. And I think I see a jacquard too in the corner here. Yeah. I yeah, so yeah, I mean, I think it's Jessica, it's just like you're that whole, uh, you know, matching your fabric and matching your, your thread and just, you know, having to do those tests uh, that I keep telling you everyone to do uh, to make sure that everything, you know, you're getting the right color, different colors on different fabrics as we saw with the natural dyes, like all of, all of that, you know, all of that prep that you do before you go to the final piece. Um, Trish, it's Allison. Um, I just had, I was kind of curious about if, um, I mean, it was interesting to sort of see the the different um, sort of versions on velvet, right, which is a completely different kind of weave structure, even though it's silk than some of the like bladder weave structures. Is there, I mean, do you have any insights on um, just if weave structure sort of, if, if there's good sorts of structures to kind of think about if you are choosing fabrics? Um, yeah, um, I, I would say that, you know, um... <laughs> Yeah, if you if you're going to, yeah, it depends on what you what you actually want. I mean, I kind of like things quite deconstructive. So, you, if you but if you did use a very open woven weave, um, you know, um, you're not going to get the um, the kind of control that you may have got with something that's tighter. You know, um, so you know if you use kind of I've done things on cheesecloth and sort of really open linen type fabrics. Um, just a different look to it. Um, so you want a tighter weave to get more control. Uh, if you want an integrative line, you know, keeping in, you want that kind of control, then, you know, you, you want to be on cottons. Uh, but, you know, if you, you know, if you, you know, if you get onto heavier fabrics, you know, of course, then you're, you're, you're going to get a different feeling, more textural uh, with what you get. Um, but like I said, it's trial and error. And, you know, you sort of have happy accidents as you're going along, you know, you find a fabric that does something that you don't expect sometimes uh, with both boutique and with uh, um, Shibori. Uh, just comes down to, you know, sometimes it's just about uh, the mix of um, the two fibers that they put together. So um, yeah, it's a trial and error thing, but, you know, I would say the tighter the weave, the more, uh, control of line you have. Absolutely. Um, we probably have time for um, one more question, um, either from students or if there's anybody joining us from outside of the university, um, either about process or the archive or things you want to see more. We'll just uh, open it up. Anyone? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things I feel like this is such a fascinating conversation, right? Because you have um, sort of I, I think the work that you're you're doing, um, Caleb, is it's almost like this detective work, right? Because we, um, you know, tech files, we, we don't know who the makers are, and we're sort of having to guess about sort of process and what's happening um, with like the sample that we're looking at based on that kind of process-based knowledge that we have um, just from from our own kind of creative practices. So. Um, it's just, it's really exciting to see just, I think, all of these different um, amazing sort of samples that are not only sort of inspirational in terms of thinking about like how we might, you know, design or sort of mimic or, or sort of use some of these kinds of techniques in our process, but also thinking about just the, <clears throat> the history of making that kind of um, ends up happening uh, behind it as well. 
Um, and then to hear, I think you, Trish, then also be able to add in your sort of expertise as far as like what, um, how these things are actually made and the techniques that are happening um, and, and, and that you all are sort of learning these in class has just been, um, it's been really exciting uh, for me um, and I hope for everyone else. Um, any, um, I, I think the only one question I might just leave us with is, um, I know like Caleb, you are here in Portland, um, like literally in the textile hive right now. And so um, uh, I'm curious, like, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about just the, the, the sort of experience of being sort of in person with these fabrics versus um, sort of uh, having them in this kind of photo archive form. What do you feel, what do you feel like are the advantages or disadvantages of, of, of either of those kinds of experiences? Uh, well, I think uh, being able to search and find things like there were times before things were digitized where we might know we had something but couldn't be able to find it. I feel like um, that's a big advantage and just, you know, having people be able to join from wherever they are in the world and be able to um, gather access. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, the in-hand experience is uh, always going to be the primary uh, experience, especially with textiles, um, just because they're tactile nature. Um, and uh, I I think each of these textiles is like a vessel of knowledge. Um, so it's filled with all this information, but um, like you said, um, without um, people like Trish or my mom who are able to uh, talk about why something is important, how it was made, where it was, um, where it comes from to provide that context, um, you're kind of almost missing out. So I really think about the physical the digital and the contextual aspects. And um, my project was really um, my best attempt to kind of merge all three so that we weren't just thinking about something uh, digitally um, that was separated from the physical collection, that it was all, um, it was intended to be one um, full uh, um, kind of integrated collection. Um, well, thank you so much. We are at 10 o'clock. Um, thank you so much uh, to you both for taking the time to talk through this amazing collection with us today. Um, I'm hoping, yeah, when we're back in, uh, you know, not COVID land that we'll be able to come down and see it in person, Caleb. Um, it's, it really is incredible um, what you've put together um, with your mom. And, uh, and we are just so lucky to have that here as a resource in Portland. So um, great. Um, uh, this uh, this will be uh, um, this recording will be sort of made available to PSU students after um, this presentation. So um, I'll send a link out to your faculty um, uh, with with all that information. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us today, and uh, hopefully we will get to see you at some of the events coming up uh, later this term. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Caleb. It's been amazing. <laughs>